All right, Jack, what did you think of the reading? From which reading? The One-Eyed Giant? Well, there was a lot of stuff, but whatever was due for today, you can comment okay. on. Um, I liked the idea of the right mind okay. um, and the metanoia, uh -huh. the passage from ignorance of self to the enlightened moral awareness. And I also like the idea of that we can't fully um, eliminate evil. I like the quote, um, love triumphs in this life, not by eliminating it, but by resisting it every day. I thought that was pretty good. Good. Um, because having um, utopian, having um, impossible goals just distracts you from actually being able to solve problems. Right. right. And while you're solving problems, you're going to realize you're going to run into real evil. You're going to run into people who are dedicated to covering up that problem, right? Or to giving a false solution because they make money off of it, right? But you'll spot it if you aren't living in some la la land, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so so that's good. Melanie, did you have a reaction to the Merton essay? Um, not so much. I just thought it was interesting um, reading about Gandhi. Like it, it seems like all of, I guess, like all of these people kind of start out as very shy and like to themselves. And it's just interesting to me to see the journey of, you know, how they move and find themselves being, I, I don't know, it's just cool. I relate. <laughs> okay, well, actually, Melanie, there's a more recent one and I'm writing an essay on her. It's okay. Melinda Gates, actually was very much a Hestia. Um, <laughs> she wanted to be behind the scenes when Bill started his foundation and his little kids and, she wanted to just, she's a perfectionist. She wanted to get all the data points, right? Mm -hmm. And then she's working on women's issues and she asks the people she's working with, well, what more can I do? And they said, Melinda, well, you have to become a public icon to represent this. Mm -hmm. And she really didn't want to mm -hmm. because she knew she'd get trashed which she has gotten trashed. But anyway, it's, I will send you the article that I'm writing right now because I think you'd like it, especially since you took the women's issues because I actually, the theme of it is Melinda and the goddesses. And it okay. shows, she's completely unaware of this, but her story actually, it has all the goddesses in it. Wow. Isn't that incredible? And it yeah, that has is. that she fell in love with love and then she had to like, bring it to earth it's so mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> anyway I'm really enjoying writing it and I wouldn't have mentioned it except that yeah she's a she's a contemporary one yeah and she's one that I think you especially could make into your icon right your hero yeah um but anyway that's a little bit of a it's not really um distraction I mean it's all related so let's go to, um, where are we? Ah, here we go. Getting it complicated. Um, and uh, another thing I have to remember is not to confuse Melinda with Melania, right? Uh, Melania Trump actually not long into the presidency ended up in the hospital and nobody was quite sure you know well she was having a facelift <laughs> okay that's not melinda gates right <laughs> um nobody thinks that's funny all right Okay, so here's Gandhi. And 
we talked about his life quite a bit because there's so many themes in it that I think are really interesting. And here's the, he was shy, right? So there is a kind of, as Melanie knows, there's that personality type that um, is Hestia that's quiet, introverted, but very intellectually focused. Um, and so that, hello, Mia. Um, did you read, did you come with something you wanted to talk about? Um, I actually came with kind of a question. Okay. Which, uh, yes, I did get into my stuff today, by the way. So that's exciting. Everything should be posted today, um, which is good. But was that, uh, wait, was that recently? Because I did check it a couple hours ago. It was, uh, I got in like, yeah, just recently. I got in earlier today to Google Classroom, but I couldn't get into Docs. But when I checked my Docs, I had everything back earlier today, or like literally like 45 minutes ago. Okay, if it's 45 minutes, I think that's okay, because I did check it not very long ago, um, but maybe it was an hour, an hour and 15 minutes ago. So I just want to okay. make sure you can get it to work. All right. Yeah, so, I, so but yeah, my question was about, um, it from the like yeah the Gandhi and the one eyed giant the he talks about suffering being an illusion like uh um um, 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 um. yeah I, he I don't know there was like a big part about it being suffering is like just simply an illusion but he didn't there was no elaboration on it it just was like suffering is illusion and then nonviolence is violence like but what how what's the idea behind that like what how is it an illusion like that was my question. Okay. Like, um, I don't, uh, yeah, I just wanted more context on it because I didn't really understand what the point of that part was. I kind of got lost in translation there. Okay, well, um, the Bhagavad Gita is about Arjuna and he has to, his cousins have committed this horrendous deed. And they've created a whole lot of negative karma. So it's his religious duty to bring back positive karma. So he has to go to war against his cousins. And he doesn't want to. But Krishna, who is Vishnu, coming to earth. So whenever the earth gets out of whack, the three-part Brahma, so the Atman Brahma, the, the energy of the universe, has three aspects, creation, destruction and preservation. So Vishnu is the preserver. So in order to preserve the positive karma, he comes in and incarnate, he incarnates himself. And he, some of the previous incarnations were uh, a wild boar. Um, uh, they were, they tend to be animals, an elephant. And there are festivals to um, Ganesha as an elephant female um, goddess, and there's a big festival to her. But anyway, so he comes in the form of a person, Krishna. And this is really, you could say, just the guy's alter ego, you know, like um, you have who, who uh, Fred Flintstone, you know, he would have the angel over here and the devil over here sort of talking to him. Um, but it's Arjuna talking to himself or Maybe you can take a literal uh, meaning, but he says that you need to do this, but do it in a detached way, right? You aren't taking pleasure in doing this. You aren't taking revenge. You aren't gratifying any sort of um, desire, right? Maya is desire. So you have to do it for the sake of the Atman, to regenerate the positive karma. And so that's uh, that has something to do with suffering, right? Suffering is related to maya, desire. Um, and when we start with Buddha, that, that's really key. The cause of suffering is desire. So it's a nice question because it leads right into Buddhism. 
Uh, but Hindu had that also. Um, okay. Does that help? Does that help, Mia? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. That answered it beautifully. Thank you. Okay. And again, the reason why it's so confusing to a Westerner <laughs> is that we, our culture is very materialistic in its mm -hmm. science and in its values. And obviously, we don't like suffering, right? We have all sorts of pain pills for just about everything. And whenever I went to the doctor the last 25 years, she would always give me this pain pill and that pain pill. And I just thought, I don't want pain pill. <laughs> like it's, I, you know, unless I can't sleep or something, like I got hurt, I feel pain. My body is giving me the signal, you know? Um, but we have, I don't know, a low tolerance for pain, or we have some idea that we have a right to not have pain, but then we eat all this stuff and don't exercise. We do so many things to bring on pain or take a risk. It's just crazy. But anyway, my point there is that our culture would make it very hard for somebody to understand that, right? There's not very many Americans that think pain is an illusion, right? Okay, right. So, so that's that's the issue. Um, all right, neither the ancients nor the moderns. So if you remember in the beginning, the right away in the Hindu chapter, it said if there's any corrective to the West, if there's any tradition that really is the other side of the West, it would be Hinduism which means we shouldn't think of it as the other, we should think of it as we need it, right? We threw out the baby with the bathwater, you know, we need to find their insights. We can really gain from that. Okay, so this is kind of, Merton is picking up on that, that neither of them are complete in themselves. So we have to go to a higher level that's neither one. And it isn't sort of glued together. It's something higher that accounts for both of them. Um, then the other lesson, I, I do want to encourage you to think that everything in the world is truly spiritual in the cultural world. So every time you see somebody, you have to think that they have a life story and it's based on some idea of good or evil, some living for the sake of something greater than yourself or cynicism, right? Or, I mean, it's there's a philosophy and if it isn't in their mind, it was in the minds of the people who molded them, their parents, their authority figures, like people, you don't know who a person is unless you know sort of the history of their spiritual life, their ideas of good and evil. Um, okay, does that make sense to you? <laughs> we are primarily spiritual beings. We aren't primarily physical beings because we're willing to put up with all sorts of physical deprivation for the sake of an idea, right? So ultimately, ideas are more powerful. Okay, anyway, so one of the lessons was that when, um, when Gandhi tried to adapt to the West and become totally Western, he really started to understand his own tradition a lot better. And he stayed faithful to it because now he knew the essence. He knew what it is under the surface between the West and his tradition. And he thought, well, since I grew up with Hinduism, I'm gonna keep Hinduism honest. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep reminding Hindus of how they're corrupting their tradition. Because, you know, the Westerners need to do that for their own tradition to keep it honest. And because I grew up with this one, I can do it better and you can do it better, but we're doing the same thing and we ought to get to the same place. Um, okay, the people of India were awakening in him. Um, so you can think about when people look to a leader, they're projecting something that they need 
into that leader, right? Well, what is it that they need and why that person and what do they think that person really is? And that happens in political stuff a lot. People project into Trump or Biden or somebody all sorts of stuff. And he's just like, that says so much more about you than it does about that person, right? And, and it's hard. You have to self-correct so that you really do understand somebody's character. Um, but anyway, so Gandhi was reminding Hindus. Do you remember when Confucius did that? He was reminding the Chinese back in the golden age, we're better than this. We want you to be a real Chinese person and real Chinese people treat other people this way and have the great harmony, right? Well, that's what Gandhi's doing. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a uh, spiritual leader, Jesus was saying, this is what Judaism is really about. And Socrates was saying, this is what democracy is really about. You need to live like I do, ask people questions. Um, so it's the same pattern. So we've had it with Socrates, Jesus, Confucius, Gandhi. We're going to have it with Buddha. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And then lo and behold, we're going to have it with Muhammad. So that probably surprises you, but it's why I like Hindu Smith, uh, Houston Smith's book, is that it really lends itself to being taught this way. That's what his eye of the soul was when he wrote it, even though I don't think he made it explicit. So I make it explicit. Do him a favor. Um, the interior life is not entirely private like everything your ideas inside of you that drive you affect everybody outside of you and not just your local social circle but your political life um and so that's gandhi was very aware of that um he he was aware he wasn't what you would call a political actor he didn't he, his goal wasn't, well, if I do this, how many people will follow me, right? It was, this is the right thing to do. And if it hasn't, it's bound to have an impact. But I can't, I'm, that's not my primary motive to get X number of followers, like a politician will use rhetoric to get people to vote for them. So it's, it's not that kind of political. It's, you have to keep in touch with the Atman, send out the karma, and it will have political consequences. Um, all right. Uh, and that's a lot like Confucius also. If you keep in mind the great, uh, what a Chinese person really is, and you keep the great harmony going, then it'll have political consequences. Um, the need to be delivered from evil that are in himself, right? So don't project evil onto other people. It's in you also. Um, and of course, we, we need to be delivered from it, but we have to, you know, that's just a day-to-day -day process and don't ever think if we can just get rid of those X's, right, either Republicans or Democrats, then we'll have, you know, everything will be better. It's not true. Um, sin is already a punishment. Um, okay, we have to be able to experience it as if it were our own. That's Greek tragedy is that you know, you think, okay, I'm going to see a tragedy about a woman who stabs her husband to death. And I mean, you know, that's awful. Well, then you go to it and the playwright wants you to imagine being her. And all of a sudden it starts to make sense. And I was like, oh my God, I could do this. And then you realize, you know, when the veneer of civilization cracks open, we have a lot of capacity to do some really barbaric things. And we ought to be aware of that. And we ought to have some mercy um, and understand people. Um, 
let's see. So you have to admit, yeah, I could do that. I don't want to believe that. Or I could have voted to crucify Christ. You know, I could have been one of those people that didn't get it. Uh, if you don't get that, and I have a lot of students who were raised to think, no, Jesus knew he was the Messiah and he's all sort of going through the motions and you just believe in him and you be saved. But that is not the way the last, the story of the weeks right now, like we're two weeks before Easter. The way that story is structured is as a Greek tragedy. And they knew that, right? They know Greek tragedy. They've seen plenty of them. So it has that same structure and it has um, people that are better than most Jesus, people who are worse, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then the masses in between. And the, the tragedy is they couldn't tell the difference between the religious leaders and Jesus, just like the Athenians couldn't tell the difference between their leaders and Socrates or between a sophist and Socrates. And um, anyway, it's, it's the same thing. And so he's just saying, you, you have to learn this lesson that, that you could do this. And every time a child is born, they can get caught up in the same kind of delusions. And, and every human being has to learn this reflective capacity. It's not genetic <laughs> and it's not easy. But if you don't do it, if you keep denying your capacity for evil, you keep projecting on other people, you, you aren't self-reflective and self-corrective, you're like a poison. You can't have a marriage when one person is always blaming the other, right? You can't have any kind of meaningful relationship anyway. Um, and so that's why you would choose nonviolence, because violence just doesn't help. Um, okay, it's a dialectic. And then metanoia is actually, if you want to read um, St. Paul, Romans, Book of Romans, chapter 12, I think. But noia, nous, is mind, and meta means to change, um, to change your mind, to uncover your real mind from, and it's like revelation, it's the light of the mind. Um, what is a mature political consciousness? This is so important because Americans do not know. They don't know what a mature political consciousness is. Um, okay, Jesus, blah, blah, let's see. Um, man is animal, but is spirit, right? We've gone through this theme over and over. Um, don't cooperate with things. And that would be now, I would say, be very careful about your carbon footprint, right? Um, and again, I have I have a carbon footprint and I don't I don't live in a cave or something. Um, I fly on airplanes, but I'm always aware of it. And I wouldn't do things that are just frivolous. Um, Anyway, so the atom bomb is not going to solve problems. People really think, thought that. Now that we have the atom bomb, we won't go to war anymore. <laughs> yeah, sure. But that's that looking for the silver bullet thing. Not so. Um, so when you hear that, the people thought that. OK, so for me, it's like, no way. Then you have to try to imagine, okay, what was it like? Why would somebody think that? And then you have to think, well, because they hadn't gone through this process of becoming a lot more self-reflective. Because, you know, Americans really thought as long as we have all the bombs, it'll be fine, right? <laughs> And like, we're the only ones that actually used two nuclear weapons first. And, you know, the rest of the people in the world don't think that we should be the only ones in the world with these bombs because we're not going to be the peacemaker. Like, we've already dropped two of them. 
does everybody understand how absolutely stupid that was and is? It just has this American exceptionalism behind it. And it is so false. And it just makes us more and more violent because we think we're the peacemakers or we're superior. Or somehow we're different and we won't abuse this power. Um, okay, so I mean, I'm at, at the, okay. All right, so hold your thoughts for a minute. Here's the last page. I definitely, you have to react. Um, what is a mature political consciousness? Um, we have the UN Charter. We have, you know, if you read it, it's about human rights. But, and then you have to ask yourself, what are we by nature? Are we by nature evil, by nature good? And that's where Aristotle says we're not born either one, but a child gets habituated and a culture, the whole culture can have the wrong goal and it can collectively try to mold people to achieve a goal that is the wrong goal. The main ones are to get as rich as possible, like that's gonna benefit everybody, that's a lie, to be as powerful, right, military, conquest and that's a lie um or just the effort to rule for the sake of the rules at every step of the way that's realistic um what is cynicism what's idealism cynicism you assume you assume people are irrational and you have to treat them like herd animals or you have to compete against them because if you don't get them they'll get you and it justifies all sorts of bad behavior um all right, so the, the what, socialist countries um, like China um, really focus on economic rights, cultural rights. So they provide, uh, lift people up from poverty and healthcare and uh, education because they think people have a right. Now, but they don't have obviously free speech, a lot of other those individual rights. In the US, we have these individual rights, but uh, we don't have, I mean, it's pulling teeth to give people a right to an education or a right to healthcare. And we're always, the private sector is always fighting back on that, or people don't even want a common curriculum and some kind of a foundational education for their children. They don't want them educated in science. You know, so if you just take the test and give answers you know the government wants, you don't have to believe any of that. So we don't, right, we're we're we don't grant people, we have a minimum granting of people anything like middle class, healthcare, education those social things, right? Uh, social and economic rights. We're way on, the, we're the outlier. And then Brit, uh, Europe is in between. Um, all right, so I want comment from each of you about that. Um, let's start with Melanie. Um, I really like the idea that um, like the environment, people aren't born, you know, good yeah. or bad, but the environment that you grow up in kind of like manifests who you're going to be inside of you. I thought that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then I started thinking like where I'm from, where I was born, you know, I was raised Catholic, Republican, all of that. And, um, I didn't really, I didn't let that manifest that type of person in me. I kind of took it and viewed it as, okay, this is who I don't want to be. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Actually, another thing you'll like about Melinda, she's actually liberal Catholic. And she does. Oh, really? It. Yeah. She talks about it too. And so mm -hmm. I'm real excited about publishing some stuff about her because as i've said liberal catholic is humanistic it has the mm -hmm. greek stuff and she could become a kind of icon that 
draws together secular humanists with the humanistic branches of the religions. Yeah. So I'm going to keep working on that. But yeah. first I had to do the goddesses part. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited, Melanie. When I finish it, I'll send it to you and see. Okay. You awesome. Thank you. Um, and I'll write another one when I do another book about the world philosophies class. And I'll send that to you too. Okay. All right, Jack, what about you? Um, I thought it was interesting um, just thinking about the atomic bomb. Um, it's like, it's a crazy weapon. And I, I don't think that dropping it on civilians and killing thousands of Japanese, I think defending that is horrible. But I do believe that it has prevented really major conflicts since then since russia has nukes since iran has nukes i do believe that that has kind of created like a stalemate i don't think iran does okay because every time they even get enough uh uranium for any sort of domestic use apparently mm -hmm. they if they they got some that was the size of a pencil lead or something and israel goes ballistic and yeah it, it's yeah. it's interesting israel has tons of them we yeah. sell we sell four billion dollars worth of military stuff to israel we give it to them every year every yeah. year i don't know if i support israel <laughs> well i mean if people knew the facts they would at least say okay we this is a big problem and it's we got to work it out that's yeah. if you can't if you know anything and you don't think that you don't have a mature political consciousness <laughs> mm -hmm. okay what else jack i did think it was interesting how you were talking about everyone has a uh, has a philosophy or how a philosophy has shaped them in some way i definitely believe that um that you have to kind of see people and kind of give them a little bit of grace because everyone has a different philosophy on life. So you can't, you can't judge everybody based on your own philosophy. I think that's important. Well, that's why I teach, I like teaching the class, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is you working it out, but now I'm giving you some stuff that I think you should think about, mm -hmm. you know, because I hope most of my students appreciate the reading just to help them work out their own worldview better does that make sense yes ma'am yeah okay because i i think people are tragic like they have good intentions when they work out those worldviews at least a lot of them do and but they just aren't educated there's just stuff they need to read yeah uh okay good thanks and Again, I wish I could have you guys more times, but I guess I had to retire at some point. Um, okay, Mia. Um, I, it kind of adds on to what Jack was talking about, but I liked whenever you talked about like being self-reflective, like the importance of being self-reflective and how, especially because I, I don't know, I've never really thought about it before, I guess, but America, we definitely, you kind of talked about how it's like, oh, we have all the bombs and I don't know, we we just tend to not look within ourselves as a country to, to like think like hey maybe we have our own issues within the country that are making us feel like we need to have all of these like nuclear weapons to like protect ourselves and be i don't know there, there's obviously an issue if we have to have all of this stuff to protect ourselves from everyone else whenever like we wouldn't have this many enemies if we didn't I don't know. Obviously, something's going wrong if we're having this much like bad energy with other countries. And so I think that was something that was interesting. Um, and then I also liked when you talked about like education uh, within like you were talking about uh, how like uh, socialist countries, they prioritize like economic and uh, social issues like poverty and then healthcare. And then you talked about education a little bit, which you kind of touched on it, but it brought up the question, which I've never gotten like a clear, like concise answer. Why exactly? I mean, is it to like demonize education? Like, why do we not get like college paid for? Because like people like places like France, like I know that their citizens get their education like that for free. They can just move on. I, I believe it was France. I learned that 
in my friend's class. I don't know if that's still true, but I think it is. No, France is the one. Uh, I think they have the highest taxes on rich folk in France, and then they have all these services. And then you, and then Americans say, well, why do they live in France? Because they like the culture. Rich people live there because they like the fact that other people get, you know, housing and health care and education and vacations and time off when they have babies. I mean, there are rich people who really value services and they're willing to pay their taxes for it. Amazing. Okay. Okay, Mia, anything else? No, I was just wondering like, so why why exactly is it that America doesn't have that? Is it because we don't have a, our, our society, our system isn't set up that way? Is that why we don't have this? It's communist, it's atheist. I should have the freedom to teach my kid whatever I want to teach them. Gotcha. <laughs> as long as they pass the GRE, no, I mean the whatever high school equivalent. Um, whatever that's called. But yeah, I mean, not only is it, it just goes a lot deeper than not free college. It's not quality education, K through 12. So that by the time you graduate, you actually are educated, uh, right? Um, so we have a problem there that, I mean, mothers will sit and ed educate. We have 25% homeschooled in Arkansas. Can you imagine what those kids are learning? Um, did I tell you the history book one of my students had? Um, I was teaching Darwin as part of intellectual history. And I said, look, this is just about scientific method. It's not about the meaning of life. It's just about how Darwin got to that. He used this method and it worked and it's a theory because it's been confirmed so many times. It's way more stable than a lot of other stuff. And um, I said, like, if you took a history class and the teacher was Mormon, would you want the history prof the first day to go one, two, skip a few and spend the whole year on Joseph Smith and the Mormons? No, you're basically learning historian's method, right? So I had a student who'd been homeschooled came up afterwards and said, Dr. Beck, my history book, history book said, God caused the storm that crashed the Spanish Armada ship so that Protestantism would take over as the dominant religion in the West because God loves Protestants better than Catholics. That's what his history book said. All right, Mia, are you convinced that we get high quality education? K oh, I know school? we don't. I know we don't only because like my, I graduated high school, top of my geography class. And I thought that Illinois was inside of Chicago, like literally learned that this semester it was not. So I know for a fact that if I was the top of that class, and did not know that there's an issue. Yeah. So I know for a fact. It's it's a problem. I guess my daughter said some survey was taken where people think chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Oh. Oh. oh boy. Anyway, I mean, here's what we have though. China is going to be our nemesis in your lifetime, okay? Now the Chinese kids, I'm telling you, no child left behind. They get it one heck of an education. It's just very rote, right? So that everybody knows all the same things and they, you know, just learn a STEM kind of learning the whole way. Okay, so that's one side. There's no, not a, no, there's no critical thinking. There's just memorizing and applying formulas or something. The other side is just like, uh, cowboys and Indians, I mean, frontier, whatever the heck you want to tell your kid, uh, you know, as long as your kid can pass that high school equivalent exam, you, they can think anything. Um, so the, those are both serious problems. 
Um, and they will lead to a lot of tragic choices. People might have good intentions, but they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Okay, Mia, one other thing was for you to go back to that virtue of an educated voter. Toward the end, it explains why Republicans demonize public education. It's socialist. And then he points out that it's the opposite of what our founders wanted, because our founders wanted to educate, you know, to have a high quality public education. So yeah, Mia, for whatever, like for your final paper or whatever, you should really relook at that because that's important. All right. So I, I talk a lot and we're gonna we're getting behind. Um, but all of you have interesting things to say too. So um all right, so let's see, we did the women in Hinduism, um, the difference between spiritually, you know, the life of the spirit is not gendered. It doesn't have secondary sex characteristics. It doesn't have, you know, particular emotions tied to it. Like the spirit doesn't get jealous or angry. <laughs> it's a spirit. All right. So then after, there's always some code of Manu, there's always some, when a religion get institutionalized, the culture is sexist, the religion justifies sexist readings of the texts, sexist applications of the texts. So that happened in um, Athens. Socrates was not a machismo guy. He was, his teachers were all women. So he is much less gender, you know, he's gender neutral in his way of life. Then um, Jesus treated women as equals. His way of life to love was very non-machismo and very uh, gender neutral, really, in the way he treated people as his equals. Confucius is a different one. I mean, there's Neo-Confucians that say there's no reason why this couldn't lead to egalitarian marriages, right? It didn't in his day, but it's a pretty easy application, I think. Um, and now we're at Hinduism, same problem. We're gonna have the same problem in Buddhism and we're gonna have the same problem in Islam. Um, all right, so for this, this one, Oh yeah, so we had Hinduism and the environment. And that's what I said, you didn't have to read the article. I have an outline. And I did not assign Buddhism and the environment for today, but I said, you'll read it, I'll assign it in a, in a couple days. And I just wanted you to put those together because they're obviously very closely related. So that's just, on that post, you have both of those and then the um, Buddhism, the chapter, but so here's the Hindu um, stuff. And I, I think it would be natural that you would think if karma is the, is the goal that, yeah, it would not be in favor of exploiting nature for human well-being. That's bad karma. Like all of that stuff is bad karma. Um, so the materialistic orientation of the West, which is that you exploit nature for human well-being. That's our, that was our founding fathers totally bought into that. God gave us, God gave Europeans America because it was a frontier. It was God's will for us to come, cut down the trees, plant crops, industrialize, use science, because it was right when science was emerging and freedom and equality and all those values of enlightenment, all of a sudden uh, Columbus discovers America. A lot of people thought that. I, I hope you understand that. And that's also why we still have this American exceptionalism. Like we're different. We're special in the eyes of God. We're the city on the hill, you know. We're not sinners. We're not like those Europeans. <laughs> Ah, it doesn't work. We end up with an oligarchy, the rule of the rich, instead of the rule of people who inherited wealth and inherited land. We have people who their great grandparents were self, 
uh, driven and, and succeeded and made a lot of money. But by the time they pass it on, these kids are lazy bums and you've got then oligarchy, the rule of the rich and a lot of rich, spoiled brat rich kids that get power and wealth without ever earning it. So that's a big problem. Anyway, but Hinduism, the, it was corrupted when the West colonized, but to get back to the roots of Hinduism will definitely um, lead to environmental stuff. Um, so religion provides strict sanctions for people who violate the creation, right? You get punished for that. Um, let's see. So his argument, this is important, that the stereotype is that religions are backward. So all over the world, people didn't take the vaccine for religious reasons. That was a major, that's still a major factor. And so you've got, you've got the stereotype science versus religion. And I do think that is really unfair. And I agree with this guy that if we need to get religion on board, if we're going to become sustainable, and there's every reason to do it. It's, it should be intuitively obvious that it's a violation. It creates bad karma. And so it's only because the Westerners came in there and corrupted their religion and their culture, partly for the good, partly for the bad, but on this environmental stuff, definitely for the bad. Um, okay, so let's see. Hinduism was respectful until the West became influential. Well, I mean, the West helped them develop right? So the material conditions of life could get better, but at the expense of spiritual and cultural, it also made people greedy and power hungry, right? And more violent. They're violent toward nature. They're violent toward each other. They're competitive and adversarial, and that's considered a virtue. So, I mean, there's, again, there's always a trade-off, like, uh, Mueller, Max Mueller, there's really two sides always. Um, the sanctity of life. Um, let's see. All right, there's uh, some technical stuff. You can, if you have questions, you can, you know, I'll talk when I get through the outline. But the duties to animals, obviously, if people come back, it's re reincarnation, you should not. You don't kill animals for sport. Like, <laughs> come on, that that is so offensive. Um, killing animals for sport. Just think about that on a Hindu view. My gosh, um, trees. You don't trample on plants. I mean, all of these things have this energy in them, so you don't you don't treat them violently. It's not. You're part of this whole big energy system. Um, all right, the Hindu scriptures even have this, the sanitation cremation of dead bodies. Um, so the trouble, the creation, cre uh, cremation creates air pollution. Um, it was there to prevent the bodies from rotting and spreading disease. And then they're also, the ashes are uh, put into the water, but this was before air pollution or water pollution were a problem, right? What they knew was the problem of a dead body. But so it looked like it was a recycling. But now that they have so many people, they have to try to try to, you know, convince people that a different way of doing it is going to lead to more positive karma. Um, the caste system degenerated. Um, it was based on ideas of sustainable development. And there is a, a woman, Vandava Shiva, who went to PhD from Harvard in economics or something. She, her big thing where she and Bill Gates just totally disagree. 
is that Gates is all about how technology, we have to use technology to get to zero carbon. And her thing is that the farmers in India are in, still in touch with the land and the water systems. And, and we need to get back to some indigenous knowledge and we need to have the sustainable farming. So my view is, would you guys just talk to each other? And, and, you know, in parts of India, yes. Like Bill Gates, you don't have to have your philosophy control every square mile of the world. But Vandava Shiva, you have to recognize that we're too far along and we need technology for some things. Uh, sucking carbon out of the air. I mean, there's stuff that that having this sustainable farming is great, but it's not going to solve some other stuff because of where we are. We've already, if we had gone sustainable 50 years ago, okay, but we didn't. So I just wish they would talk to each other. But anyway, there is that we definitely need some people to be pointing out that we've got to have more respect for the natural world. We can't just look to technology and continue to have our lousy attitude toward the world. Um, and so there are these movements and they, they know they're in the spirit of Gandhi, right? These nonviolent resistance movements. This time it's toward the natural world instead of to get rid of the British, right? It's related to colonialism because the colonialists taught them how to exploit their natural world and pollute it. But it's a focus. The focus is on environment. And in the mind of a person from India who knows about as much as you know, this would make total sense. And I think it, it's compelling. And I think they can get quite a few people to go with them. Um, all right, so this is a quote. I, I like this quote and I think you should think about it. Until recently, the role of cultural and spiritual heritage in environmental protection and sustainable development was ignored, right? Because there was an assumption, religion versus science. And the scientists are for sustainability and the religion people are nutcakes. And they, I don't know, they aren't, or they don't think about it. Anyway, it was ignored. Uh, many, many fear that bringing religion into it will threaten objectivity, scientific investigation, professionalism, or democratic values. But that doesn't need to be the case uh, in order to have in a spiritual dimension for environmental protection. Um, that for many world religions, the abuse of nature is unjust, immoral, unethical. So again, my whole class here is about humanism. Obviously a humanist is gonna be in favor of environmental protection and sustainability because they base it on science. But if you remember, some humanists are spiritual humanists, religious humanists, or they're the humanistic branches of these different traditions. Um, and, and that if you're a humanist, you don't have to be anti-religion. If you're a humanist and an environmentalist, you don't have to be anti-religion. And it's even better for you not to be. But the pandemic has made this worse because there are religious leaders or people are afraid. And religion is, for a lot of people, motivated by fear. And so fear the vaccine, you know, um, and that that's awful, right? It's awful. It's been bad in our country, but it's particularly bad in developing countries because they really need to get people vaccinated. But my students at Asia University for Women, as soon as they had a chance to get vaccinated, they did. And they could not believe that Americans had the opportunity and chose not to, it's just like jaw drop. It would never occur to them. Um, but that's, they know there are people in their country like that, but they didn't think Americans would be because Americans are more educated. Uh, but surprise, surprise, <laughs> uh, 
you can rhetoric can manip, people can be manipulated and that's what you need to know and there are going to be lots of problems that you all will have to solve <laughs> um i think a lot of the unvaccinated were uneducated in the u.s yeah yeah Probably just a high school diploma yeah okay but not all you know there were just chunks. yeah true my nephew actually and his family robert kennedy jr has like a whole cohort of people mm -hmm. um it's all about corporate profit or something like that yeah they like uh, said they were like fetus tissue in there oh well there's like, that yeah that's it's propaganda. Well, the thing about it is um, Donald Trump's, his particular kind of cure or therapy before vaccines, mm -hmm. one of those, it started with an R, uh, did use fetal tissue, but somehow nobody cared or noticed then. <laughs> we got to get the president from not dying, you know? But yeah, I mean, Jack, can you understand that? Like there was fetal tissue used in that one. And then yeah, people that's... like, oh, oh, fetal tissue. I was like, yeah. no. Cognitive oh. dissonance. Well, you want to find this pattern and, and vaccines are not at all what they were using before, you know? Yeah. Or they wouldn't have used, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I actually had just heard about another thing like that, association. Well. I, I talked to a student who doesn't use birth control because that was used for eugenics to try and get rid of African Americans, you know? And it's just like, wait a sec. <laughs> you should use birth control if you're sleeping with your boyfriend, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just because it can get used for bad purposes doesn't mean that, you know, if you take it, it doesn't mean white people are trying to, you know, kill you out <laughs> to have you die off or something. Oh my gosh. So these associations, um, and they just last in people's minds. So that that's what I'm getting at. You have to be really careful about rhetoric. So anybody have a reaction to the outline on Hindu and environment? Yeah. Um, I think that we've definitely corrupted the environment to serve our needs and that um, we, there needs to be more of an effort. I don't know if we can like fix it with industry or a new technology. There's just a quick fix, like you're saying. Um, I think that just needs to be more care taken to the environment instead of just abusing it and exploiting it. I mean, do you think we need to change our ideas, right? Yeah, I mean, American industry favors profit over the environment. I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon, in America anyways, but But what that's kind of- I mean, it's not gonna change as long as people think that God wants us to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So, you know, the Christian view, because you said philosophy is important, right? And philosophy shapes people. So you can teach Christian kids that stewardship of the earth. When God gave Adam, he didn't give it to destroy it. Yeah. Right? But there are going to be Christians who think, well, God knew this would eventually happen. And if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. So we don't have to think about that. Right? Dad. That makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, that just reiterates your point that we really need a, a new philosophy. We need ideas or we're never going to solve the problem. Like the high tech fix without a change in ideas, we're not going to get there. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Do you think that's true? Yeah, there definitely needs to be a change in philosophy. I think that you could argue that, I think every Christian should believe that they're, they should be stewards of the land, right? Like, I think that's kind of 
anti-Christian to say that to destroy the world is, is, is a good thing, but it's been kind of twisted that way. Yeah, I mean, the book of Genesis, you know, God gave, you know, Adam said, fulfill the earth and subdue it, right? And it gets translated lots of different ways. So, I mean, it can get quoted to mean, well, God could foresee that eventually we would destroy it, but that's okay with God. You know, it's a book of Revelation, it's Armageddon. It's taken out of context. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but anyway, you are going to live through a culture war about that too. So good luck. Anyway, you, I mean, it, no matter how frustrating it is, it always goes back to the power of ideas, right? That's why I majored in philosophy. I knew it was important. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mia, what about you? Do you have a comment on this issue? I just have an addition on to what you guys were talking about, which is like the whole thing with the, or kind of how you said it, or like it could be argued that God like foresaw that we were going to destroy the, the world or whatever. But the whole thing with that is like, God gave us the power of free will. So it's like, we get to, we still get to choose. It's not like, well, I mean, at least the way I was taught, I, I don't really know necessarily if that is hundred percent accurate but what i was taught in church was like god gave us free will and you i mean it's not i don't know your fate's not necessarily set in stone there are different ideologies and theologies to that but like yeah you 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 get to make a choice like we as people get to make a choice and we get to have i don't know say into what happens so it's like maybe he foresaw it but there are also different outcomes that could happen. So maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, it, free it's, it's confusing when you say that God gave you free will, but he already foreknew what you were going to choose. Yeah. And he'll punish you for it anyway. Huh? Right? So, yeah, no, I, when I was in high school, I decided that would be the number one thing that you'd roast in eternity forever on slow boil for if you destroy the environment, right? It doesn't get any more arrogant than that. Right. That makes sense? Right. I know, yeah, I mean, he, God, you literally gave you all of these resources for you to, for us to use and we're just like ruining them. So yeah, he gave us everything. We're just destroying it all. Right, So, so on that view, it's stewardship. And you right. violated your stewardship, you're going to roast, right? Right. But that isn't the majority of Americans. I don't think the majority of them, if they push came to shove, because capitalism is God's way, and any kind of government intervention for environment is socialism and atheism. So God must have known eventually we would do this. Do you guys, I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I wish I were. But does that make sense to you that that would be a line of reasoning in a lot of people's heads? It's just a, it's like ignorant. I mean, it's a lack of educating yourself and like just having, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's ignorance, it's lack of having decency and respect for things and appreciation for all living things, which I guess we kind of just talked about, which was like, everything has energy, but can't destroy it. But like, you, it's, you're not yeah you, also okay that sorry i'm having lots of thoughts in my brain right now also i feel like though um people are like the government sort of markets itself in a way to where like it doesn't seem like you're destroying the environment whenever like with this this and this so people are just kind of like blindly i don't know they're like just not seeing the force of the trees like they're not even seeing the big picture if you got the data if you would you know, if every day the front page of the news would explain what's going on with uh, climate change, people would all be completely in agreement. It's just people do not know the facts. It never even comes up in the news. It is astounding because we've known all this stuff for over 50 years and it just never comes up in the news. So the news is, is, is absolutely biased in favor of profits. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, my main point here is that a Hindu or a Buddhist, no Hindu or Buddhist politician could get get elected for saying the stuff that our politicians can say, right? Just because of our background story in terms of our worldview. Does that make sense? I mean, they can they can say, well, we had to let this corporation in because it provides X, Y, Z jobs, but they'll, they're not going to say God thinks it's okay to destroy the natural world and it's the end times. If you're Hindu or Buddhist, they're not going to be able to get get that to get away with that. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, Melanie, any other comments? Because you commented on this at the beginning. Yeah, so I, I don't have um, many new comments. I just kind of want to reiterate the fact that, like, yeah, we use nature, a natural thing that we, oh, it's just crazy, a natural thing that isn't touched by man, it's not man-made, and we just destroy it, we make it into a commodity for us, and I don't, it's just gross, I don't like it. <laughs> we make ourselves into God, right? Why bother, we don't need a middleman, <laughs> like, um, okay, so Melanie, here's with you as a humanist, you might want to say religion, ah, you know, it, it's I don't care if it's a bad interpretation those religions are anti-science and they're all going to destroy the earth mm -hmm. or you can say wait Christianity and you and okay the the Jewish Christian Muslim tradition is more likely to justify it because you've got this God in history with this plan but Hindus and Buddhists no right and Confucians. And so, you know, as a as a humanist who wants to sort of figure out how we can find a cohort of people that mm -hmm. will go with this, you just need it to make subtle distinctions all the way along. There are, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so so Melinda Gates. Um She's working on women stuff almost exclusively, and her husband is very much into the tech stuff. But they really reinforce each other, right? Mm -hmm. She's her goal is to get every woman having access to birth control by 2030. Yeah, birth control is a big issue for sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. The number of people that we have. Um, so those things actually fit together, even though they don't look like they fit together. But yeah. if you think about it, they do. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna do is spend just a few minutes going through the Buddhism outline and then we'll all be hot to track to talk about Buddhism next time, okay? And then, yeah, we're getting behind, but again, you guys have good comments. And of course, I always talk whenever you have a comment, I always, Spend a lot of time, but anyway, I I really like this book because it has these six aspects of religion, and in your mind you can go over that in terms of Socrates, uh, Jesus, Confucius, Hindu, and you can anticipate, and then Buddha, and you can anticipate that Muhammad's going to do the same thing, so you can start to see this pattern, and then. I think these are important patterns in history, and I, I wish history were taught with some of these patterns because they're classic, right? Classic. Um, but it's often not because the Enlightenment has influenced how historians function and what they get rewarded for and all sorts of stuff. So life goes on. Anyway, just for you to ponder quite a bit what this means, because it has all, if you can think of your own applications um, and examples, Buddha's doctrine, so the cause of suffering is desire. That's why suffering is an illusion. It's your own bad desires that cause it. So you want to be released from desire. And when you read this, you can think about analogies with Aristotle's virtues, which I'll talk about, right association, the importance of friends, right, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we have the basic concepts. The characteristics is this, it's empirical. It's not anti-science at all. 
and it and western scientists are finding out god this guy knew a lot about the brain i mean uh meditation really is good for you oh really after how many thousand years of testing i would think so you know um it's just it it sort of makes me mad the arrogance with which they even say oh this actually you know is pretty scientific like what what sort of arrogance caused you to think it wouldn't be you know uh, <laughs> superiority complex you know so zen buddhism that then all you know the spiritual genius they were both spiritual geniuses um and what the qualities they had. Um, and then I have some slides. I have some artwork from each tradition. And we'll go over that. And then later on, we have an article from the same book about women, about women in Buddhism. And then we have the environment in Buddhism. And we have art. And we have some Hindu art. So I don't know if I'll get to it all. But it's all there. And we'll see how much we can get to. So what did that your assignment for next time? Uh, I think I'll I'll make it into, I guess it'll just be Buddhism chapter and then Buddhism in the environment. Um, and I might post some of these other things, Buddhism and women, I have and Buddhism in the brain. So you can anticipate that. Um, but I guess we're just gonna have um those two for now because that's well maybe i'll actually have you read one of these other ones too the woman one chapter isn't very long um okay so thanks i'll see you in a thanks couple days time. all right take care okay mia i will i'm happy that you've been working on it so...